The following program was sponsored by friends and partners of the Lift Up Jesus Ministry. And she's not there for the elders, and she's not there for the religious leaders. She's not there to be seen. She's not there to pay for anything. She's not there for anybody else. She's there for God. I want to welcome each of you to the Lift Up Jesus television broadcast. I am Pastor Dudley Rutherford, and I'm so glad you've joined me here today. Do you know what really takes your Christian life to the next level? It's not just reading the Bible or listening to Christian teaching. It's doing it on a regular basis. That's why being here each and every week and hearing this message is so important. My sermon today will give you new insight into God's Word. So make sure you have your Bible, a pen, and your notes handy, and let's begin. They are the steps that the Jewish people would have walked up to go inside of the temple. And of course, the temple was the place where they would make sacrifices. The temple was the place where they worshiped. The temple was the place where they gave. The temple was the place where they went to pray. The temple was the place where they went to learn. Now again, Luke is recording this. So you have the four Gospels. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew wrote the book of Matthew. Mark wrote the book of Mark. Luke wrote the book of Luke. John wrote the book of John. All four of them are simply writing the story of Jesus from their own perspective. And so each of these writers have different uh, nuances in the letters that they write. Luke, if you, if you study the Gospel of Luke and you really pay attention, you'll notice that Luke, throughout the entire Gospel, he's always writing interesting uh, stories and tidbits of information concerning the temple. The temple is all throughout Luke's gospel. You, you should read it and mark down every time something's happening in the temple because that's, he, he mentions it a lot. For example, this is just, has nothing to do with the sermon. Uh, go to the end of Luke 21, the very last two verses. In fact, I read these two verses, this picture that you're looking at just a few weeks ago. I read these two verses to these people sitting on those steps, Luke records each day. Everybody say each day. It wasn't once a week. It was every day. Jesus was teaching where? So every day, Jesus went up these steps, went into the temple, and he taught. And the Bible says that each evening he went out and, and to spend the night on a hill called the Mount of Olives. So what we see in that verse is every, not, not once a week, every day Jesus would walk up those steps, go inside the temple and teach. And every night he would come down those steps and he'd go spend the night uh, on the Mount of Olives. And the very next verse says, and all the people, say the word all, they came, they came, they came, they came what? Some of you are not answering. They came what? Oh, they were never late. <laughs> they were there early. In the morning to hear him where? To hear him where? So it's just, it's just like he's writing this letter and he just has this little tidbit of information about the temple. Okay? And you see that throughout the whole book of Luke. Now, Everything in Judaism, everything in Israel took place in this temple. And one day Jesus is up there and he's teaching. Now let's go back to our bookends. The front side bookend number one, before he gets to this story, is, is how the temple 
had been turned into a den of robbers because it was supposed to have been the place where the Old Testament sacrificial system of having, uh, making sacrifices for, your, for the sins of the people. It was supposed to be a holy place. It was supposed to be a sacred place. It was supposed to be a house of prayer. But it had been turned into a den of robbers where everything that was happening up at the temple had been perverted by the religious leaders, ripping people off, collecting money, fleecing people in order to line their own pockets rather than actually uh, help people grow in their faith and in their walk with God. So right before the story of the widow in Luke chapter 21, book in number one, Jesus is talking about the religious leaders in this temple and look at the three verses before Luke 21. So you got to go up to Luke 20, verse 45. While all the people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples, beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at banquets. And verse 47, the verse right before the story of the widow and the widow's might, Jesus says, they, the teachers of the law, they devour widows' houses. And for a show, they make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. So the first bookend is judgment and punishment to be thrust upon the religious leaders and the lawyers who somehow were ripping off widows and acting like they were spiritual in the process, twisting the laws, twisting the rules to swindle people in order to line their own pockets. Look at those two verses again. Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes, love to be greeted in the marketplaces, have the most important seats in the synagogues, places of honor at banquets, and they devour widows' houses, and for a show they make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. That's bookend number one. The religious leaders should have been looking after the widows in their distress. But the temple had lost its purpose. It was supposed to be a house of prayer, and they had turned it into a, an extortion racket. The temple was no longer bringing people closer to God. Instead, it was actually keeping people away from God. It was as though if you want to get close to God, you have to pay to pray. Book in number one. Then Jesus tells the story of the widow and the widow's might. But what's the second book in? Right after that story, write this down. Jesus announces that the temple is soon to be destroyed. That is an interesting, interesting bookend. Before the widow's might story, he talks about the religious leaders in the temple ripping off widows. And what he says immediately following is really quite shocking. In verse 5 it says, some of the disciples were remarking about how the temple was so beautiful. It's like the story of the widow's might went right over their head. They didn't even comment on it. He tells the story about this woman, that she gave everything she had to live on. The very next verse says, some of the disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned. And look at these beautiful stones and the gifts dedicated to God. And Jesus says in verse 6, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left upon another. Every one of them will be thrown down. In both Mark, Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel, the story of the widow's might leads directly into the prophecy of the destruction of the temple, which happens in the year 70 A.D. Now capture this picture. The disciples are standing around. They're listening to Jesus teach. They're looking at the magnitude of the temple. And if you ever go to the Western Wall, it's, 
It's just a tiny, small corner of the foundation that remains. The entire temple did eventually uh, come down. Jesus is upset at the religious leaders. He then sees this widow give everything that she has to give. He makes a comment about it. It goes right over the disciples' head. They start looking around, thinking, boy, look how magnificent this structure is. And Jesus says, you guys don't even get it. Everything you see here will soon be destroyed. Those are the bookends. Now, so what is this story about? What is the basis for the story? Write these two things down quickly. Number one, the purity of the woman's heart is far more important than the arrogance of the religious leaders. Someone say amen. amen. The purity of that woman's heart, the widow's heart, is far more important than the arrogance of the religious leaders. Number two, write this down. The amount of the widow's gift is far more significant than the wealth of this temple. And as you study this story about the widow, we end up where we always end up, no matter what we're talking about. And that is that God cares about what's in your heart. Forget about all the things in this world that are distracting. And forget about all the things in this world that are demoralizing. And forget about everything in the world that is destructive. Forget about everything that is deceiving. Forget about everything that is depressing. Forget about everything that is wrong with religion. And ask yourself today, what's in your heart? Is your heart pure or is it full of pride and arrogance? Is your heart meek or is it just full of me? Is your heart fixed on God or is your heart fixed on greed? Is your heart swimming in lust or is your heart fully devoted to God? Is your heart full of sin or is your heart broken because of sin? What's in your heart is the question. And that leads me to the third and final phase of this message. That this widow, faith, bless her heart, is a picture of next level faith. Everybody say next level. Next. Oh, this is a whole nother level. He said, I tell you the truth. He said, this poor widow's put more than all the others. All these people gave gifts out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. I want you to write this down. This widow touched the heart of Jesus because her heart was fixed on God. Oh, you go back over this series Unlike Abraham, I have never been asked to sacrifice my son. Never been asked to do that. Unlike Job, I've never lost everything in my life and been asked to keep trusting. Unlike Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I've never been threatened to be thrown into a, a fiery furnace. Never happened to me. And unlike this widow, who's alone, she's forsaken, she's poor. I have never put into an offering, literally, everything I have to live on. Never done it. Oh, I give and I give generously, but I've never given everything. And truthfully, and you might disagree with this, and I've never heard a preacher ever say this, I don't even thank God expected this widow to put those two copper coins in the offering that day maybe he did maybe he didn't but I, I don't think that God expects the widow who only has two copper coins which if you want to know what that was worth back in those days back in those days for two copper coins you could buy one dinner roll that's all she had to live on 
I don't think God expected her or wanted her to do that, in my opinion. But she did. And that's why we're talking about her 2,000 years after the fact. The question is, why? And if you miss this, you've missed everything in this sermon. The reason she did that was because her heart was fixed on God despite the fact that the temple had been turned into a den of robbers. Despite the fact that the religious leaders and teachers of the law had defrauded her. Despite the fact that no one was looking after her. Despite the fact that her gift size-wise was so small. Despite the fact that the temple would soon be destroyed. Despite the fact that no one else was truly sacrificing, giving out of their wealth. The question is why did she walk into the temple that day, she opened up her purse, she looked in and all she had was two small copper coins worth a dinner roll. Why would she take all that she had and give that to God? Why would she do that? That's the question. Because her heart was fixed on God. And number two, write this down. She chose to trust in Him. Even if no one else was trusting. Oh, don't miss this. She knows that God is worthy. She knows that God is faithful. Stay with me. Don't anybody leave. She knows that God will take care of her. She knows that the system has failed her. She knows that her gift is not really going to make a difference. She knows that the religious leaders of that day had misused their power. She knows in the eyes of the world that she's not worth much. She knows that no one is really paying attention to her. But she's there. And she's not there for the elders. And she's not there for the religious leaders. She's not there to be seen. She's not there to pay for anything. She's not there for anybody else. She's there for God. And she loves the Lord. And she loves the place of worship. And she's thankful to God for sustaining her. And she's choosing to trust Him. She's choosing to keep her heart fixed on God no matter what else happens around her. I heard a funny story about this wealthy woman. She had no faith. Never goes to church. Never been to church. But she's got a lot of money. And one day she went to this church. It was an old country church where they sing these hymns. And she'd never been in church. So she was there and she got trying to sing along. Then she noticed they were passing this plate and people were putting money into it. She didn't even know what that was. So she took out, she got a lot of money. She put like two or $300 in an offering plate. They never, no one had ever done that. They took up the offering. This old preacher stands up and says, oh, we have a special guest today. Someone put in an extra large amount of money, and you don't know this, but we're going to let you pick the next three hymns. And she goes, okay, I'll take him, I'll take him, and I'll take him. I don't know for sure why you came to church today. Maybe you came to find a spouse. But my prayer is that you will realize, book in number one, when you walk in here, there's always going to be people who are going to let you down sooner or later because this is not a perfect place. We're all made of feet of clay and people in positions of leadership sooner or later, someone's going to let you down sooner or later. And the second thing I want you to realize when you walked in here that everything you see one day, this whole, that one day, if you live long enough, this building will no longer be here.
But every week, you could make up a thousand excuses not to come. I could give you a thousand reasons why there's so many hypocrites. Just stay home. Church is not important. You don't need God. You don't need to worship. You don't need to go to the house of God. You don't need to give anything. But I would tell you every week of your life, no matter what's going on in the world, God knows you, God loves you, God cares about you, God sees you, and you should be here to worship the Lord. You should be here every week to trust in the Lord, every week to continue to get your heart fixed on God, to study God, to pray, to participate in the Lord's Supper, for He and He alone will never leave you and never forsake you. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We could make a thousand reasons why we, we don't have to be here. There's hypocrites everywhere we look. But the question is, is your heart fixed on God? And will you continue to trust in Him, even if no one else does? Will you keep trusting in him? That's the story of the widow and the widow's mind. Oh, I hope you were blessed by today's message. As I told you earlier, it's listening to the teaching and preaching from God's word on a regular basis that makes such a powerful difference in our lives. So let's plan on being here again next week, same place, same time. What do you think about that? And if you're ever in the Southern California area, we would love to meet you on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning here at Shepherd Church. It's an amazing community that will have a powerful and positive impact on your life. You can find all the service times and locations on our website at liftupjesus.com. And in the meantime, I want to encourage you that whatever you're doing and wherever you're going, don't forget to always, come on, do it with me, lift up. Jesus. Hi, my name is Kathy and I lead the Anchor Cancer Support Group here at Shepherd Church. On August 17th, 2011, I heard the words that nobody wants to hear, and that is, I had cancer. And when I had um, that diagnosis, I did not want to share it with anybody, but God had a different plan in that for me. And so it was pretty clear that during my surgery, my chemo, my radiation, all the side effects that I experienced, and even losing my hair, that God knew that I was going to be where I am today. The things that I experienced when I was going through my journey by getting love from other people, getting food, getting prayers, uh, even provisions that I didn't expect was such a blessing to me that I knew that I had to turn it around and give it to others. So God put it on my heart to lead a cancer support life group in my home. We call on each other, we take each other to our doctor's appointments and we pray for each other right before we're getting ready to go in for our treatments or our scans. We also provide food and, and support for them during their journey. Later on, when I was ready to start the group, God gave me the name Anchor. And I know now why. Because when you think of an anchor, you know that it is linked to a chain. And the members of this group are the links of that chain. That we're linked on to one another, strong, standing firm to our Father, who is our anchor. And together, we walk this journey with them through this storm, knowing that we need to depend on each other and through our Father in heaven. This group is for everyone. If you're going through cancer, if you've already gone through all of your treatments and you are in remission, it's also for those that are part of the family. Maybe it's you're the caregiver. Maybe it's your coworker. It also could be for the spouse or the children. And more important, this group is for those that have lost someone that have finally gone to see our Father in heaven. And they come back and they share their journey and they love on one another because they've walked that. There are a million and a half people in Los Angeles County living with some form of cancer. And I am so grateful to Shepherd Church for opening up their doors to allow us to have this amazing ministry here. The people of this community need this ministry. And we are so happy to be able to have it here so that we can give them hope and encouragement during their journey.
as I look across this audience, I see miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. And I want you to know, listen, that the world around us, the world around us right now, they are standing up and they are taking notice of what God is doing over here at Shepherd of the Hills Church. They are noticing. Hey, it's Pastor Dudley Rutherford here at Lift Up Jesus Radio and Television Ministry. And I want to thank you for being a part of this ministry, listening here today. What you need is the Great Shepherd. And if you've got the Great Shepherd, you don't need anything else. Our desire is to take the gospel to the entire world, not just to your city and not just to your house, but to every city and to every house. And we know that we're living in those last days. The Lord has to come soon. There's just too much going on in the world for him not to come. As you look back over 2020, I want to ask, has he not yet still protected you? Has he not still yet loved you and financed you and guarded you and cared for you and watched over you and forgiven you and kept you all of 2020? 20? Has not yet God taken care of you? Don't ever, 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 ever give up that no matter what Satan throws at you, you just keep putting your hope in God. And I would tell you that right now with the current fears because of COVID-19 and with the use of our online services, that it is easier now to lead people to Jesus Christ than it's ever been before. We need people like you who believe in this ministry to come alongside us and to support us faithfully with their prayers, with their finances, with the word of mouth. You can share this on social media, but we need people like you who would seriously consider becoming a partner with us. It's just about lifting up Jesus, preaching the word in an uncompromising manner and have a chance to put their faith and trust in Jesus. Because what is needed most in the United States of America is the revival and the people of God turning their hearts back to an almighty God. That's what's needed most. The preceding program was sponsored by friends and partners of the Lift Up Jesus Ministry.